Good morning, church. We are continuing on in our life of Joseph this morning, our series called Plot Twist. Pastor Kirk is going to break down God's word for us this morning as we think about how those plot twists in our lives build our character. I'm gonna be back with you here in just a few weeks. I'm excited to return, share with you some of the things that God has shown me and taught me. Uh, but really, I'm excited to see how you guys have continued to grow in godliness as you've heard more from God's word this summer. So I'll be seeing you soon, but until then, let's continue on our series, Plot Twist. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody? It's good to see everyone here today. Thanks for joining us today at H&W. Hey, um, if you have a Bible today, turn to Genesis chapter 40. Uh, four. We'll pick up in verse 18 in just a moment. But before we get there, I just want to catch you up. In this moment in the story, uh, we run into a plot twist amidst many plot twists in the life of Joseph. We've been covering the life of Joseph this summer. Uh, his life is an interesting one with lots of hills and lots of valleys. Uh, and we find him now in a place of power in Egypt. God's brought him to this place of prominence. And he's working his own plan at this point. And here's what's going on. His brothers have come. Uh, they saw him. Remember, his brothers sold him into slavery at one point in his life. So they came to get food. He had food to give them. He put food in their bags. But they left one brother at home. His name's Benjamin. For Joseph, it's all about Benjamin, okay? Not to be confused with uh, Diddy or with Biggie. For, for him, it's all about getting Benjamin to Egypt. And so he sends them back and he says, look, you guys take this food, go home, eat it. But if you come back, you should know that you need to bring Benjamin. And just in case, I'm going to keep your brother Simeon here with me. So like Simeon gets the raw end of the deal in this story. I mean, we don't talk about it much, but poor guy just had to sit in prison waiting for his brothers to finish eating their food or have a conscience. They don't have a conscience, and so he just sits and waits for him to come back. So they come back, and they bring Benjamin with them. And here's the deal. At this point in the story, what's happening is that Joseph is trying to figure out a way to get Benjamin from his brothers. He's put together kind of a scheme, a plot to turn the tide against them. They still don't know he is who he is. And so he's trying to figure out a way to get them there. And so what he does, he fills their bags again. He puts their silver back in their bags the same way he did the first time around. And then the last thing he does is he takes his personal silver cup and he puts it in Benjamin's bag and he sends them on their way without any of them knowing what was going on. So again, this is kind of his scheme below the surface to get Benjamin um, in Egypt away from his brothers. So the guys go down the road a little bit. Joseph sends his steward after uh, the group of guys. They find them. They find the cup. Joseph says, well, it looks like I'm going to have to make your little brother my servant forever, and you guys can go back home. And that's going to be the end of the story. That, that feels like that's what's about to happen in the story. But then Judah, who P.S., is the brother who came up with the plan to sell Joseph into slavery, speaks up. And here's what he says, verse 18. But Judah approached him, Joseph, and said, My Lord, please let your servant speak personally to you. Do not be angry with your servant, for you are like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, Do you have a father or a brother? And we answered, My Lord, we have an elderly father and a younger brother, the child of his old age. Talking about Benjamin here. The boy's brother is dead. Okay, so that's talking about Joseph. He's the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him to me so that I can see him. But we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father. If he were to leave, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, if your younger brother does not come down with you, you will not see me again. This is what happened when we went back to your servant, my father. So he's retelling the story. The boys go back to Jacob and then we pick up here. We reported to him the words of my Lord, but our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we told him, we can't go down unless our younger brother goes with us. If our younger brother, Benjamin, isn't with us, we can't see this man. And your servant, my father said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them is gone for me, speaking of Joseph. I said he must have been torn to pieces and I've never seen him again. And if you also take this one from me and anything happens to him, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. Basically, I will die. 
So if I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, his life is wrapped up with the boy's life, and when he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. Then your servants will have brought the gray hairs of your servant, our father, down to Sheol in sorrow. Your servant became accountable to my father for the boy, saying, if I don't return with him, I will also bear the guilt, or always bear the guilt, for sinning against you, my father. So Judah's saying, if I go back to my dad and Benjamin's not with me, I'll bear the guilt of him of this for the rest of my life. Not just that I let my brother stay as a slave in Egypt, but also that my dad died in response to losing his other son. And he says, now, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. Let him go back with his brothers, for how can I go back to my father without the boy? I could not bear to see the grief that would overwhelm my father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage today. And Lord, in the same way that you've spoken to us through this whole series, we just pray that through your word today, you would speak a very direct word to our hearts. God, we love the story of Joseph. We love the narratives of Genesis because they remind us of ourselves. Lord, we're human like so many, um, like so many of these people in these passages. And so, Lord, teach us today. Uh, speak to our humanity. Help us to become more like Jesus as we study today. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So this is a really significant moment in a very long list of significant moments in the life of Joseph. Judah, one of the brothers who sold Joseph into slavery years earlier, willingly volunteers to become Joseph's slave in place of Benjamin, their little brother. Don't miss how thick the irony is in this particular moment. Everybody see it? The brother who made the plan to sell him into slavery is now standing before him, offering willingly to be his slave. What a moment of temptation, right? So Joseph has worked his plan to perfection, and like he is moments away from pulling it off. He's about to take Benjamin from the brothers. And then there's this moment that happens, the one that just stood out to me this week as I study. This moment when he cracks when the dam breaks, when you find that Joseph can't follow through. And it's not that he'd be wrong to follow through. He had every right to do what he was about to do. It would have been fine if he would have kept Judah as a slave. It would have been fine if he would have taken Benjamin from his brothers. He had every right to do it, both as a man of power in Egypt, but probably even more so as a man who had been through what he had been through at the hands of these guys, and yet he couldn't follow through. He got stuck right? He cracked. He can't bring his father that kind of pain and grief. He's moved by the altruism of one of his brothers that he didn't expect it from, who may have grown up a bit since he advocated to put him on a camel and send him to Egypt. Let's look in the next uh, passage, uh, passage or, uh, chapter 45, verse 1. We see Joseph's response. It says, Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all his attendants. So he called out, send everyone away from me. This is the ugly cry moment. No one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers, but he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and also Pharaoh's household heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence, as they should be. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me, and they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. And you can just see like the brothers are going, oh boy, here we go. Next sentence, and now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here, because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. See, God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. 
He has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire land, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Return quickly to my dad and say to him, this is what your son Joseph said. God has made me lord of all of Egypt. Come down with me without, or come down to me without delay. You can settle in the land of Goshen and be near me, you and your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and all you have. There I will sustain you, for there will be five more years of famine. Otherwise, you, your household, and everything you have will become destitute. Look, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin can see that I'm the one speaking to you. Tell my father all about my glory in Egypt and about all that you have seen and bring my father here quickly. Then Joseph threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and he wept. And Benjamin wept on his shoulder. And check out this next sentence. Joseph kissed each of his brothers as he wept. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Y'all, Joseph had been through all kinds of hell leading up to this moment in his life. He had been in the lowest position any of us could imagine being in. And he had gone back there over and over again until God raised him up to this place of prominence. And yet, he is able to see that God brought him through all that hardship So I love these words from the passage, just going to use them, so that he could use Joseph to preserve life. God brought him through all of that narrative so that he could preserve life, not just for Egypt, but for his people. See, Joseph can see the purpose in all his pain, and that's a big blessing, isn't it? See, there's a great deal that we could talk about this morning. There's a lot of directions we can go from this passage. As you know, like Old Testament narrative, because it attaches so clearly to our humanity, you can go in a lot of directions. There's lots of layers. But for me, there was one word in this passage that stood out this week. It gripped my heart. And if you would, just look back at verse 1 of chapter 45. It says, Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all his attendants. So he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. The word that stood out to me this week that I just could not get away from is the word composure there. In Hebrew, it's afak, and it means to restrain oneself or to hold back. And listen, there's nothing super special about this word. I don't have all these like cool meanings that come from all these different places. No, in this particular instance, it's the circumstances that give way to the meaning of this word. This moment is one of those in life that we relish because it's one of those moments where love triumphs. Where love triumphs. When the dams we've built to protect ourselves give way and love spills out. See, these are the moments, uh, or these moments are why we leave, leave, leave room for hope in our lives. That we don't become so cynical that we can't believe that something good could come of this. These, these are the moments, this is why we reject cynicism as a component of wisdom. See, these are the moments in our marriages when we've been fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting, and then we remember how much we love that person on the other side of that fight, and cracks begin to form in the foundation, and love leaks through. Right? We celebrate these moments when love triumphs. These are the moments when friends are in feuds or fights, And they finally give way under the sheer force of love that's been built up over years and years of friendship. See, I think God smiles when love overruns the banks. Right? The banks of our fights and our squabbles and our fears and our frustrations. When love triumphs in situations where we could have responded in a thousand other ways. So I know we've spent a lot of time in this particular passage and even recently have been there, but if we could, I just want to look really quickly at another passage because I just, it feels like what we just read, that what's going on in the life of Joseph in this passage, just, it's like peanut butter and jelly or like lime in the coconut or what, you know, whatever. <laughs> so if you have, if you have your Bible out, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 15. We're going to briefly look at the story of the prodigal son. It just reminded me of it this week as I was studying because as I was working my way through the passage, you get to this point where all these hugs and kisses are getting doled out to people that you should hate. And I'm like, that reminds me of something. Luke 15, here we go. Let's read this together. 
A man had two sons, and the younger of them said to the dad, Father, give me the share of the estate I have come to me. So he distributed the assets to them, and not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. And after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck the country, and he had nothing. Famine, right? Remember that. Then he went to work uh, for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired workers. Remind you of anything in particular? So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and threw his arms around his neck, and he kissed him, and the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight, like he gives him the spiel, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. In this story, you have a father completely disowned and socially humiliated by his son. And like, mark my words, what the son did to him was intentional and it was unbelievably hurtful. He has no reason to invite his son back into his life. And then love overflows. It leaks. He can't help himself. You see this dad who has a son who's coming and you have the son who has rehearsed his bit like I'm just going to be a servant. I'm going to earn my way into right standing with my father and the dad just can't have it. He lifts up his, his robe, not his skirt, but his robe and he takes off running which again like I haven't noticed this as much because I'm always so focused on the two brothers in the story but the dad humiliates himself again in front of the city in order to cover his son and not force him to experience the humiliation of the long walk home. You ever notice that? The dad takes the humiliation on himself so the son doesn't have to experience it. How amazing is this dad? He runs to his son and the love just gushes out of him onto his son. The son didn't deserve it. He hadn't earned it. If anything, justice in this particular situation would have been that the son never came home. Look, you disown me, I disown you, part ways, have a good life. But in this particular instance, it's like that dam breaks and love just gushes out. It's similar to the story of Joseph where the dam breaks and love just can't hold itself back and gushes out. Lord, I love these stories They're a vivid reminder that in a world where we expect tit for tat and eye for eye, that grace is an option. It's often one that we don't love in the moment, but man, we love it when it comes our way, don't we? It would have been just to make the son a servant. It would have been just for Judah to have been Joseph's slave. That would have made perfect sense. And you would have gone through the story and everything would have seemed totally normal. Yeah, you were the one who got him sold into slavery and so you are the one who gets to be the slave now. But it doesn't go that way, does it? It doesn't go that way. Instead, the prodigal son, and in our story today, Judah and his brothers get a whole heaping bunch of grace. You know, I'll tell you, I want God's love to ooze out of me like we see it oozing out here through the life of Joseph towards his brothers. I want to struggle, not with being a jerk, <laughs> but with holding back love from people. Like, how great a problem would that be? But I'll tell you, as I age, I find that my heart wants to go the other direction. Can anybody relate? It's not that my heart wants to be more open and more loving. It's that as I age and experience more life and more hurt and more difficulty, my heart wants to get smaller and a lot larger. 
I want to build more walls than tear them down. It's interesting. C.S. Lewis has a quote. It won't be on the screen because I added it late, but I just want to read it to you from a book called The Four Loves, which kind of gets... It kind of gets pushed aside sometimes in C.S. Lewis's works. I would just encourage you, if you haven't read it, go give that book a read. But he says this famous quote from the book, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. See, to love is to be vulnerable. So the question that I'm asking myself as I experience life and feel that proclivity that draws us away from the sinner we talked about last week where we still have a hopeful heart, draws me towards cynicism in life, draws me towards negativity in life, draws me towards a lack of hope in life. I'm asking how do we maintain a heart that, can, that is vulnerable? How do we become people who leak love and gush grace rather than locking ourselves in prisons of our own cynicism. And I think our passage teaches us a few things about that. So if you have a pen and paper today, if you're taking notes, I just want you to write down a few things. Number one, love leaks, it overflows when we are deeply secure in God's love for us. Love leaks, it overflows when we are deeply secure in God's love for us. For us. Y'all, Joseph understood that God had been working in his life all along. And I want to make this distinction because it would be very easy to miss. Without the concept of God's providential work in his life, Joseph would imagine that his life is just a series of unfortunate events. If he's not thinking God is at work, he's just thinking my life was awful to this point, and then some good stuff happened at the end. Right? He might think, I have really bad luck, or worse, that he's cursed. But he sees his story through the lens of the goodness of God amidst all the strife, all the difficulty that he's experienced. You see it in verse 5. You guys look there. It says, uh, this is Joseph speaking. He says, and now, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here, because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. You can see how Joseph is seeing his life through the lens of God's goodness and love. So it's significant in this moment. See, because Joseph is secure in God's love, he can't help but love his brothers. Without that security, there's no way. See, one of the things I've learned in life over the years and student ministry and dealing with the students that my wife uh, leads on a regular basis as a teacher is that those who have experienced love are more given to love. But those who haven't experienced love, in many cases, it can be really difficult. It's a matter, I think, for a lot of people of scarcity and abundance. And some people think, well, like, I gotta be careful with my love because there's just not that much of it. I was thinking about it this week, and I know you guys have probably seen this before, but that's okay. I'm going to make a mess on stage. It's going to be fun. Last week, we talked about the importance of being shrewd, and people who are shrewd are people who navigate those waters between, on one hand, not being overly naive, and on the other hand, not being overly cynical. Okay, right? They're in the middle. They're people who are wise, but they're also hopeful, right? Those are the, that's kind of the boundaries we talked about last week. But here's the thing I think happens in a lot of our lives. Uh, and this is a thing that my dad gave me a long time ago, uh, dealing with re uh, relational equity, uh, except he would have used lollipops instead of water, okay? So in life, 
We've got these relationships. Our glass is filled with whatever you substance today, it's water, okay? And the naive person would say, you know, we come together, we meet each other, say it's a guy and a girl, and they start to date or whatever, and the naive person would say, I'm going all in. And they pour all their love in, right? We'll leave just a little bit there. That's too much. They pour more than that. Because they're naive. Just a little. And then what happens to them? This person walks away. And then what are they left with? Almost nothing. See, what happens in these people is they swing from naive to cynical real fast, don't they? When they realize, I've only got so much of this to go around, and that person walked away with all my love, and this is all I've got left. So I'm going to be stingy with my love because I recognize if I'm not, someone will take it, and I won't have any left. We get hurt, we get cynical, and then we live this life. Right? And then it starts to look like this. Right? Maybe you get married. Let me pour this back in here. You get married and you've got kind of this cynical view of love and you start this game. It's like, well, you know what? I've only got so much love and so I'm just going to give you a tiny bit. And you're like, hey, you didn't give any back. And they're like, okay, I'll give you a tiny bit too. And then the other one's like, oh, I gave you more. Okay, I'll give you a little bit more. That's great. Nope, that's too much. Let's go back. No, wait, let's hold on. Back. And we play this game back and forth and back and forth. And we fight over these things, don't we? Right, you're loving me well. You're not loving me well. You're loving me well. You're not loving me well. And we're just pouring back and forth and back and forth. This is human relationships. For most of us in the world who don't know God, this is all you get. You just have the love you have. And so you can see why it would be really easy to get cynical about who you love and how you give love out. Because love is scarce. But then there's this. I know y'all knew this was coming. Like we see in the life of Joseph or like in the life of the prodigal son, God comes in with his love and he just pours it out, right? He pours it out and he pours it out until we're overflowing so that then we've got lots of love to give. Right? And when we run out, we just go back to the source and he fills us back up and then we go back again and you guys see how this goes back and forth and back and forth see the thing we learn in the life of Joseph is that when you're secure in God's love you're more willing to give love away When you know that at the end of the day, whether that person on the other side loves me or not, whether those brothers are still jerks or not, whether they remain the way they are or if they change radically, that doesn't matter as much because I'm not dependent upon them to love me in order for me to love them because they're not my source. You're not where the love comes from. God's where the love comes from. And he's been watching over me my whole life through all these difficult seasons that I've been through. And so I can just depend on the fact that even if you guys burn me again, he's gonna keep loving me and filling up the tank and filling up the tank so that I can keep loving you. This is the way that it should work. In a broken world, it works. People just a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here. And love never overflows in that scenario because there's not enough to go around. And so we've got to be people who remember, man, if you want love that overflows, that breaks down the dam and overflows into the world, you've got to be a person who's not just being filled up by your spouse or your friends or your enemies or your coworkers and on and on and on. You've got to be a person who recognizes that the source is not another human, it's God. Amen. He's the source. If you want to love well, you'll be that person. Okay, so... In the life of Joseph, thank you back there, little guy. I appreciate it. (laughs) Amen. We're reminded in Scripture, 1 John 4, 19, that we love because he first loved us. Our capacity to love is directly attached to our relationship with God. It's true in the life of Joseph. It's true for you and I as well. See, love leaks. It overflows when there's a source filling it up. But you know what I find? When we, spend, when we depend on our spouse or our friends or family or yada, yada, yada to fill up, one ends up being empty and the other end up, ends up being full and then somebody's bitter. You ever experienced that? And that's not, the, that's not what God intended. So we fill up and we pour out. 
You get it. When love is abundant, it has a tendency to overflow. When love is scarce, we tend to hold on to it tightly. So we start today with, an ident- with our identity. Again, that first point, love leaks, it overflows when we're deeply secure in God's love. But the second one is this. Love leaks, it overflows when we deeply experience or experience deeply the grace of God. Love leaks, it overflows when we deeply experience the grace of God. Amen. Curious, has anybody get, gotten stopped this week by a police officer? Any honest people in the room? Boom, we got one, two, Anybody on this side? Just liars. Oh, three. We got lots of them. That's great. And then a few liars in the room who didn't raise their hand. That's great. Here's the next question. Did any of you get a warning? No, she got a ticket. (laughs) Sorry about that. Anybody get a warning? Right here, good job. Is it not the best feeling in the entire universe when you get a warning? Right? You're in the, I mean, like, I just, you, you see the lights, you're like, oh, and then your kids are with you and you feel even more worried about it because, you know, they don't, you don't want them to think you're a criminal or whatever. So you pull over, you're waiting, the officer comes, they tell you the bad thing that you did because you did something or else they wouldn't have pulled you over. You have the discussion, they go back and you're just hoping, God, please, I don't want to pay 250 bucks for going 10 miles an hour over whatever speed or whatever. They come back you, and some of you have had this experience and if you haven't, man, I hope you get to it at some point. Hey, man, you seem like a nice guy. I just wanted to uh, give you a warning today and tell you to slow down next time. How great is that feeling? Right? Grace. That's grace. And you know what? On days when that's happened to me, and by the way, I've gotten a few that went the other way as well, and that's fine because what's that? It's justice. I shouldn't have been speeding. That's life. Don't speed. Okay? Get your registration changed when you're supposed to. But man, those days... Those days when you experience grace, isn't it so easy to offer grace on those days? I'm looking around at everybody like, you get a pass and you get a pass. You don't have to clean your room. It's totally fine. Do whatever you want to do because I didn't get a ticket. I have more money in the bank now than I thought I was going to have and it's beautiful. Do you want me to go buy you a toy? I mean like the generosity flows when you have been treated with generosity by somebody else. Some of you can relate to this. You've been there, but not just with an officer, but in bigger, scarier moments in life where you experience grace and all of a sudden you're like, I can't quick enough express grace to somebody else because I've experienced it myself. So Joseph is aware that in a very sort of roundabout way, he has experienced God's grace and is actually now an instrument of God's grace to not only the people of Egypt, but to his brothers and his father as well. Right? How could he hold back when he's experienced that kind of grace? See, like, you've got those people in life, and you've met them who come to know Jesus, and it's like out of the blue, they just experienced all this love that they weren't expecting. And they are like, I don't deserve it. I, don't, I didn't earn it. You know, like, what do I do with all this grace? Don't worry, it's just water. It's just grace, guys. You guys get the picture, right? You've seen these people who experience the grace of God and then like, I mean, we're not talking about little grace like someone gave me a toy, but like someone died for my sins and saved my soul and I get to spend eternity with God and all my sins are forgiven and I don't have to worry about them anymore. Like that kind of deep experience that changes your life and like they're so full that what else are they gonna do but find somebody around them and pour in, right? Because they found the source. And they'll just pour and pour and pour. I love these people because they offer grace like they're made of it because they've experienced it. People who experience grace and are aware of grace are aware of the great things God's done in their their life and the gratitude that they ought to live with are people who pour out in abundance. If you wanna be a person who leaks love, be a grateful person for what God's done on your behalf. And not just God, but all the other people in your life who make you what you are and do what they do to give you the life that you have. There's a story I wanted to tell you as we get ready to conclude. Um, One of my favorite books is by a guy named Henry Now, and it's called The Return of the Prodigal Son, and it relates to our passage we read earlier. And in the book, he just meditates on this passage in Luke 15 and makes some pretty brilliant, um, I don't know, just 
observations along the way. One of the things that I think is interesting about him, though, if we could throw that painting up on the screen. There it is. So this is Rembrandt's prodigal son. Um, I don't think it's one of his better paintings, but it is, I mean, it's still Rembrandt, so it's worth a bazillion dollars, and it's better than anything I could ever imagine doing. So um, do you see the father and then the son in his tattered clothes, and you see the older brother being a jerk on the side um, doing his thing? So now it talks about how he, he came upon this painting at a time in his life when he really needed it. He was struggling internally with a lot of things. And he talks about how like he spent days just sitting in front of this, both like a poster and then he actually went to where the painting was and would just sit in the museum and just look at it and ponder it. Like I can't imagine that because I live in 2021 and I can't pay attention long enough to like tie my shoes. So that's a whole different thing. But he would just sit and reflect on it. And God would work in his life. And he said he went through these movements. One, he started out realizing, like, I'm the younger brother. I've gone far from God, and God has offered me his grace. And he sat in that reality for days and prayed on it. Later, he realized from a friend in a conversation that in many ways he was like the older brother, sort of trying to earn favor with God and doing things on, uh, in a way that would cause God to feel... Um, I don't know, compassion or goodness towards him that he didn't have to do. But then I want to read you this quote. He had another encounter. And this is the one I think is important for us today, and it's kind of the hinge of our sermon. So y'all bear with me. It's kind of a long quote, but he writes this in the book. He said, it was during this period of immense inner pain that another friend spoke the word that I needed most to hear and opened up the third phase of my spiritual journey. Sue Mosteller, who had been with the Daybreak community from the early 70s, had played an important role in bringing me there and had given me uh, indispensable support when things had become very difficult and encouraged me to struggle through whatever needed to be suffered to reach true inner freedom. When she visited me in my hermitage and spoke with me about the prodigal son, she said, listen to these words, y'all. Whether you are the younger or the elder son, you have to realize that you are called to become the father. Her words struck me like a thunderbolt because after all my years of living with the painting and looking at the old man holding his son, it had never occurred to me that the father was the one who expressed most fully my vocation in life. Sue did not give me much chance to protest. She said, you have been looking for friends all your life. You've been craving for affection as long as I have known you. You've been interested in thousands of things. You've been begging for attention, appreciation, and affirmation left and right. The time has come to claim your true vocation, to be a father who can welcome his children home without asking them any questions and without wanting anything from them in return. Look at the father in your painting and you will know who you are called to be. We at Daybreak and most of the people around you don't need you to be a good friend and even a kind brother. We need you to be a father who can claim for himself the authority of true compassion. Whew. See, I think the hinge for me this week in thinking about this sermon thinking about these jars, is that there's so many of us who spend our whole life like Henry running around trying to get someone to fill our jar. Please love me. Please give me your approval. Please pour in. Please, just anybody at any time. It's when we're teenagers, it looks like one thing. When we're in our 20s, it looks like another. We get married. We look at our spouse. We're like, please pour in. Please pour in. Please, if you could do anything, just pour in. Right? We have kids and we even ask them to pour in. And yet, like, like Henry, I think God is looking at us going, why don't you think about pouring out? I'll fill you up every day. Amen. It's time for you to be the father and no longer the sons. See, some of us, like we guard our jar like our life depends on it. We don't want anybody to have it, right? 
we guard the love that we've got in our lives and we want people to pour in, but man, I, I don't have enough. If I pour it out, I might get burned or hurt or whatever. And I think God's just like, you gotta trust me enough in this life to let me fill that thing up because my goal for you is not for you to stand back and let other people love the world. My goal for you is for you to stand up and love the world. You are to be like the father in the story and no longer like the sons. Right, God's hope in your life is that love would gush over the edges, over the banks of your life and cover the people around you. And there are people all over the room for different reasons that I haven't even mentioned that just struggle with that idea. And man, my hope for you today is that you would deal with the internal work, right? Because this is one of the things I learned this week. All of the plot twists in Joseph's life up to this point at least for the most part, were external. Like things were happening to him, but this is an internal moment, right? This twist in the plot from I'm gonna seek justice with my brothers, I'm gonna take back my little brother to holy cow, what's happening inside of me? I'm pouring out love and compassion on my brothers who hurt me so badly. And like some of us need to hit that point in our life where we're mature enough to say, in spite of all the hurt that's been done to me, I'm gonna be the father and no longer the son in the story. I'm gonna pour out love. As hard as it is, I'm gonna figure it out. Y'all, this week, um, in preparation, it was kind of a weird week of preparation, I'll tell you, but from the first time I read this passage this week, God put one thing in my mind. It doesn't even really feel that related, so at first I was kind of like, well, that's weird, God. We'll come back to that, and you can tell me again. But you know, as pastors, we wrestle with these passages as we prepare to talk to you about them on Sundays. And as I wrestled with it this week, the same thing kept coming back over and over again. And listen, this passage can apply to any relationship in your life. It can apply to friends and neighbors, to family. But the one thing that just like kept coming to me over and over this week is this, that there are people in this room right now who are married to one another who are fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And you've gotten to the point where you don't know anything but the fight with your spouse. And you're playing that game of like, I'll pour a little in yours and you pour a little in mine. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And on and on and on and on. And you know, like, if you're this person, you know who you are. Because God told me to talk to you this morning. And like, my hope is this, like, here, listen, I love when people at the end of the sermon go, that was a great sermon, Pastor Kurt, great job. Don't hear this this morning. I'm not saying, like, quit saying nice things to me. That's not what I'm getting at. But man, if I could hear one thing this week, it's that somebody got in the car on the way home and looked at their spouse and said, I'm sorry. And just let the dam break and the love flow. Like, is there just, is it, perhaps there's just someone in the room today that when you get home, you need to go in the room and close the door and you need to look at each other and say, I still love you. I'm still your person. I'm still here for you. I'm not leaving. You're not leaving. Let's work this thing out. And you both just need to drop the barriers and let the love go. And I'm aware that could apply to any relationship in your life, especially if you're here today. And that's your marriage, man. Could today be the day when that dam breaks and love comes through? One more person I want to talk to. And I always talk to these people at the end of service. And if you get tired of that, I don't really care because they're really valuable. But there are people here today who just built wall after wall after wall up in front of God because you're just nervous you're scared or whatever that thing is. Maybe you were hurt by the church when you were a kid or you just have bad feelings about something or your parents were Christians and they were terrible people. I don't know what it is, but you've got the walls built for God. And I just want you to know, like on the other side of that wall is a vast ocean of love that you can never get to the end of. Like you literally could go on forever and you would never get to the end of that love. And God's just like, the Bible says he's asking and seeking and knocking and he's waiting for you to go, okay, let's go. Right, the same way that the dad in the story picked up his robe and took all the humiliation on himself for the child, Jesus did the same for us. Jesus hung on a cross in front of the whole city, in front of the whole world, so that you and I might be saved. He took on the humiliation that we deserved so that we might go free. And again, there's this vast ocean of love waiting to just absolutely cover you up to the gills, and you won't know what to do with it. It's just behind that wall, and so I'm just asking you today, if that's you and you've got those walls up to God, but you know 
God's calling me, could you lower the walls and just allow your life to be filled and covered with the grace and goodness of God? Could you take that step today and perhaps today is a day when you would? For some of you in the room today, you know it like you know that you're breathing, that God's calling you home. He wants you to be your kid. He wants you to be his kid. And today's the day when you need to take that step and allow God to love you in a way that only God can love you. Let's pray. Father, today we come to you as people who have a tendency to treat love like a commodity that's gonna run out. And Lord, the truth is that without you, it is. But God, you fill us. You fill us with your goodness and your love so that we can pour out your love on the world, on our spouses and on our kids, on our friends, on our family, on our coworkers. And Lord, there's just, there's folks in the room today who just need to lower those walls and allow you to love them. God, you're a gentleman. You don't push your love on people who don't want it. But Lord, today I just pray that someone across this room would come to the realization that they've been running from you. They've been trying to earn your favor. They've been doing all kinds of things to keep you at arm's length. And today is the day to just let the walls fall, let the dam break and experience the goodness and the love and the grace of God. Lord, I pray you'd give those people courage today. And then, Lord, like you've talked to me about all week, for those in this room who are in marriages that uh, either because of the pandemic or because of just life are just in trouble, Lord, would you give them the courage to poke holes in the cra- and apply cracks to the dam and let the thing fall. Let your love flow over the banks of their life and onto their spouse. Lord, we know that you love reconciliation. You've reconciled us to you by the work of your son. And Lord, I pray for reconciliation today between husbands and wives and sisters and brothers and moms and dads and and kids and coworkers and just across the room, Lord, we pray for your reconciliation. Only you can do this, God. We pray that you would. Thank you for your goodness and love. We pray these things in your name. Amen. If you are here today and you are, a part, I will tell you in the first service, we had someone online who put their faith in Jesus. And so if that's you and you're here and you're like, Kirk, today is the day. I'm tired of running away from God or I'm, I'm tired of putting up wall after wall to keep him at arm's distance. If today is the day you say, I'm coming home, I wanna ask you to do this. It's really simple. Up on the screen behind me, there's a phrase, no Jesus, that we use a lot around here. And we want you, if that's you, we want you to text that number or text that phrase to the number 281-946-6500. Here's why. This is why. We have people on the other side of that number, real people, not computers, real people on the other side of that number who want to help you figure out the first steps in following Jesus. We're really serious about it. And we love you. We want you to get, get off on the right track. So if that's you, don't wait till later. You'll forget all this later. Do that right now, right? Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this week's sermon here at Houston Northwest Church. Our vision is to make Houston more like heaven by helping Houstonians like me and you become more like Jesus. Now, if you have any questions about following Jesus or you made a decision today to give your life to him, please let us know. Text no Jesus to 281-946-6500. Connect with us throughout the week at hnw.org. And again, thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we cannot wait to see you again next time. Peace.